Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study, Fountain of Life Church, and uh, it's good to be here with every, all, all y'all. Tell us where you're coming from, who you are. I see people already online, John and Peggy and Tina and Eric Smith and all you guys. Come on out. Come on out and join us. Fountain of Life Church, Wednesday night. It's going to be good. Um, and I want to talk about what's coming up at the, at the church in the next few weeks, and then we're going to get right into the scripture. Good to see you guys. Good to see Eric, Tracy, Ike, and Lucille. Good to see you guys. Um, you know, we're in the middle of we're in the middle of uh, Serve Month, and we just had Family Day Sunday. Family Day was a fantastic success for us. Hey, Monette and Ed and Carolyn. Hey, Denise. Hey, Eric. Hey, Candy. Hey, Julie. Good seeing all of you guys. Family Day was a great success for us. Uh, I think uh, I think over 400 people stayed back for Family Day after the morning services, so that was incredible. And uh, I think Edenton had a great time as well with Family Day. Good to see you, Eric, Lynette, uh, Alicia, Howard, and Vicky, Candy. Good to see all of you, Viola. Uh, so it was a great success. But we're going all week long doing things on Saturday to serve our community. This past week, we had a team, mostly our staff that went out and walked Main Street in Elizabeth City and helped weed the, the flower beds. And they, they just did a ton of work. If you're on Facebook, you can see some of those posts in the city posted about it and stuff. So it was great that our guys went out and did that. Hey, Edna. Hey, Larie. Uh, good to see you. Hey, Don. Candy. Uh, Mike and Lita. Good to see you guys. So this Sunday, uh, we're joining up with the missions team, Fountain of Life missions team, and they're going to the Souls Ministry. Their new building is across from New Quality, the old SNR, they're saying. They're doing haircuts and shaves and collecting and handing out toiletries and socks and Bibles and doing a lunch uh, prepared by our, our folks. And that's from 10 to 1. Uh, Michelle McGrath is the contact. You can also contact the church about that. Also, there were sign-up things at the Welcome Center. There were sign-ups online for it, okay, in case some of y'all missed that. Hey, Bethany. Hey, Teresa. Hey, Leon. Hey, Jeff and Margie, Rita, good to see all of you guys. Next, in the following week, the 23rd, uh, we're going to be, okay, the, the Sunday morning, front end, the Greeters, the Welcome Center, we'll be dividing time or people, depending on how many sign up, between Salvation Army and Hope Line, helping them move items and sort and clean items. This is uh, organized through, uh, of course, Stacy Hickman and Heather Snowden, that's with the Salvation Army and Hope Line, so that's great. And then the final Sunday, the Edenton campus, in conjunction with Beverly Gregory and the Senior Center down in Edenton, will be serving senior citizens in the Hertford Edenton area, cleaning up their yards, hauling off trash. So uh, if some of you would like to get in, involved with that, uh, contact Stacy Harris here at the office, call the church office, get online and sign up. You sign up on Sunday morning at the Welcome Center, okay? So just a great month just to serve our community and uh, we're ending the month with prayer and fasting. The last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of the month is going to be prayer and fasting. And then on that Friday night, we're going to be getting together and having a prayer meeting and celebrating communion together. So I want to encourage you to do that. It's good to see you, Karen. Good to see you, uh, Mary, from down and watching from New York. Good to see you, Peggy. Good to see you, Michelle. Michelle and Jeff and Bill, good to see you, my brother. Good to see Stacy and Phyllis. And uh, good to see all y'all here. I've got my faithful audience of one, uh, Dana sitting out in the crowd tonight, <laughs> and all of our team up top working very, very hard, so uh, praise the Lord. We're, we, we've been in discussions about bringing Wednesday night back live. There's just, a, there's just some work that has to be done between now and then to make it happen. Okay. Also, October, one, two, three, four, set it aside, pick up your phone right now and block out those dates. Write it on that calendar that's on your refrigerator. Do whatever you have to do to get here October 1, 2, 3, 4. If you're from out of town, come on down. Find a bed and breakfast. Find an Airbnb. Find something. Find a hotel. Stay with a friend. Uh, stay down in Edenton. Stay in Chesapeake. You can get here however you can do it. This is a meeting you want, will not want to miss. I want to show a promo right now. Uh, I'm going to show a promo right now of what's getting ready to come up. We've been doing this. For about 10 years, we call it breaking barriers. 
He gave his life for you and I, and he gave it for the thief on the cross. And I'm here to tell you, he, the highest price was paid for you and I. The salvation is free, but tonight it is not cheap. We still are not going to bow. We are not going to budge. We're not going to lower our standard. We're not going to give up on healing. We're not going to give up on the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter the result. We're going to stay true to the end. How many are believing that God's going to bring a divine recovery of everything the enemy has stolen? Right now, I decree over this house that whatever the enemy has stolen, I I decree exponential return. Let there be a generation that rises up in apostolic authority and prophesies and decrees and declares the word of the Lord and has enough audacity to watch and see the word come to pass. I literally had to turn off my phone, turn on some worship, get in the Word, because I refuse to allow the culture around me to be the thing that overshadows my life. All right, can somebody just shout hallelujah, give me some fire emojis out there or something if you're coming to Breaking Barriers, hallelujah. I mean, it's going to be great. The last, the young guy you heard, Russell Johnson, just studying a little bit about him. He has over 34,000 Instagram followers. And I heard a story recently where uh, the, his church was doing something with a local coffee shop, uh, having Bible studies there or meetings there or something. And then uh, the coffee shop said, we've looked at your website. When we, we hear what you believe, you can no longer meet here. And they said he was kind of, he was like, thank you. We'll go do our own thing. I don't know if they started their own coffee shop or what it was, but it's just like he's out there in a really, really, really woke culture and just standing for Jesus. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited, man. Wow. I'm excited to have Jane Hammond in the house bringing that, uh, bringing that prophetic gift, her and her husband, Tom, who's awesome, bringing them into our house. I just, it's just going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Get in here. Get er Come early. Put the roast on. Get your crock pot going. Get the kids' clothes ironed for the whole week. Get everything laid out so you can make prepare for the move of God. Fast and pray. Come to church hungry. Come to church where you're wanting to see God move. And if you come, if you come like that, God will meet you and God will bless you. It's hard to feed fat, satisfied, full people. But you come hungry. You, it's easy to feed you. Amen. So come hungry in your spirit. For breaking barriers, Hallelujah! We're going to be you're going to be hearing all about this every time you're around us until that time comes. It's just going to be great. We got some special music guests coming in, and uh, it's just awesome. We have some other friends coming in, uh, some other of our pastor friends. I'm inviting, so just a big fun time. Plus our guys that we've sent out who are pastoring now, they all come home, and uh, it's just a, it's just a blast. Hallelujah! Okay, if you have your Bibles, open up with me to the Book of Leviticus. And let's go to chapter 13. Last week I had a lot of great comments about the study, and it's because we dealt with Leviticus chapter 11. And if you know anything about the Bible, Leviticus chapter 11, and there's a chapter in Deuteronomy that those two chapters deal with dietary laws. And it gets to be really fascinating. When you talk about what was what God uh, allowed the Jews, the ancient Jews, to eat, and what she, what he. Uh, uh, for 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 forbade them to eat. <laughs> okay, and what it, it was really fascinating. Then we had this great discussion of uh, what does that mean to us today, and talked about the uh, Acts chapter fifteen council, and then Paul's teaching on uh, eating today and all that kind of stuff. So we came out we came out with the conclusion that we're not under the Old Testament dietary laws as New Testament believers. But the Old Testament dietary laws make a lot of sense. They make a lot of sense. And uh, they were given for cleanliness purposes. I think they were given for health purposes. And no wonder uh, people who follow those kind of lifestyles live longer. Amen? They just live longer. Okay. Just saying that and throwing it out there. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's open our Bibles then to Leviticus chapter 13. And tonight, this is going to be kind of strange subject subjects, but I think you're going to enjoy it because we'll make something out of it. Leviticus chapter 13 and on into chapter 14, it, these are long chapters, 
and they're dealing with leprosy. Dealing with leprosy and the laws and rules of dealing with leprosy. And then chapter 15, boy, this is going to be fun, deals with laws concerning bodily discharges. So, and I'm serious, but God cared so much about people that he dealt with all of this because he wanted to, uh, he wanted the people to be healthy, to be whole, to be separate from the other nations and tribes, and he wanted them to represent him on earth. So God cared about everything. You, do you believe God cares about everything in our lives? That he cares about what we eat, what we think, what we read, what we listen to, what we set our hands to do in life, what we say, what we, uh, who we associate with, uh, how we spend our time, how we worship. Yes, 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 and amen. God is, God is interested in all of it. Thank you, Cheryl. Leviticus chapters 13, 14, 15. That's what I'm focusing in on tonight. If you go to the beginning of your Bible, Start turning right. You're going to go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's the third book of the Bible, okay? So thank you guys for joining me. I'm going to read out of the ESV tonight, and uh, I have a ton of notes. I brought like 20, I think 25 pages of notes. So let's work our way through this. I won't read all of this because it is, (laughs) Cindy says, oh, goody. You're already getting excited about the subject matter. So uh, let's just take our time and walk through this, and I'll try to break it down as best as we can. But you guys are, are students like I am, and y'all come up with some of the best answers. Okay, Chapter 13, verse 1, ESV. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, Then he shall be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priests. And the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body, and it appears no deeper than the skin, and if the hair in it has not turned white, the priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days. And the priest shall examine him on the seventh day, and if in his eyes the disease is checked, and the disease is not spread in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up for another seven days, and the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day, and if the diseased area has faded and the disease has not spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is not an eruption. And he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the eruption spreads in the skin, after he has shown himself to the priest for his cleansing, he shall appear again before the priest, and the priest shall look. And if the eruption has spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous disease." Janice says priests were like doctors. To some extent, they were. They had to know what medical condition they were looking at, okay? So let's look at this. This this chapter deals with laws of purity and laws about skin diseases, particularly that of leprosy, okay? So, So the Hebrew priests slash physicians appear to have been the first in the ancient world to isolate suspected people of infectious or contagious diseases. Okay, they seem to be the first in the history of the world to isolate people with infectious disease. Okay, think about it. You're in the ancient world, the very ancient world here, and you're, 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 uh, you're millennia B.C. here. Okay, and so if you're millennia B.C., How advanced was society and how advanced was any medical understanding? So God comes and tells them how to deal with probably the worst infectious disease that the ancient world had to deal with, and that was leprosy. God gives them instructions on how to deal with it without modern medicine, without any kind of treatment like that. Isn't that incredible? Larie says it's similar to public health laws and rules today. Yes, it is. So 
the law provided that there should be most careful distinction made between actual leprosy and that which may appear to be leprosy. And when the case was clearly defined one, the method was drastic in the extreme. Okay, So if the hair on the sore has turned white and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of the body, it's leprosy. So the methodology here is that if a person could not be pronounced clean with certainty, then they were isolated until they could be declared clean with certainty. Okay, So these judgments were based on really sound medical diagnoses and concern. And the judgments were made with a concern for the benefit of the afflicted person and with a greater concern for the health of the community. Okay, So two principles are perpetual in their application. The state should ever have the right of inspection and examination. It should, however, use its right with the greatest care that no wrong be done to any individual, according to one commentator here. Okay, The type of infectious disease is not specified, but it has often been associated as leprosy. And here in the ESV, one of the reasons I liked reading this tonight is that they actually use the term leprosy or leprous because it is a tad unclear in the original Hebrew, okay? So it's saying that the type of disease was not specified, but it was thought to be Hansen's disease or leprosy, okay? Since the noun sarah-at was translated lepra in the Septuagint, it came out to be leprosy. I know y'all are interested in all that stuff. Hallelujah, okay? So illnesses such as smallpox, measles, and scarlet fever might start out with a skin condition similar to leprosy. And the person would be isolated for the necessary time until the condition cleared up. This quarantine helped prevent the spread of these kinds of diseases among the people of Israel. But leprosy was dealt with so seriously because it was such a horrible disease. It was also a dramatic picture, and many people have seen it, as a type and picture of what sin is like. That sin starts out small and seemingly uh, innocuous, but then it goes deeper and it goes deeper to, to where it deforms and numbs the person and eventually kills the person. So a lot of theologians through the years have uh, likened uh, leprosy to, the modern, to, to, to our understanding of sin. Okay, So leprosy... When it first appears on a victim's skin, it begins as small red spots. But before too long, they get bigger. They start to turn white, having, ha having a shiny or scaly appearance. And soon the spots spread over the entire body, and the hair begins to fall out, first from the head, then even from the eyebrows. As things get worse, the fingernails and toenails become loose. They start to rot and eventually fall off. And then the joints of fingers and toes begin to rot and start to fall off piece by piece. In the mouth, the gums start shrinking. And, are, and I'm reading this because I want you to get a clear picture of what it looked like in biblical times. Okay, So the gums start shrinking and are unable to hold teeth. So several teeth are often lost. And then leprosy keeps eating away at the face until the nose is literally gone. And the palate and even eyes rot. And the victim wastes away until death. Okay, What a terrible, terrible way to die. Okay, So it's like sin in that it begins as nothing. It's painless in its first stages. It grows slowly. It often remits for a while, then returns. It numbs the senses. It causes decay and deformity and eventually gives a person a repulsive appearance. Isn't that interesting? So in verse 9, it talks about when a man is afflicted with a leprous disease, he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall look. And if there's a white a swelling in the skin that has turned the hair white and there is raw flesh in the swelling, it is a chronic leprous disease in the skin of his body and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. Now, what does unclean mean? Unclean was when a person was required to live outside the camp of Israel until and if they were free of their disease. And then they had to present a sacrifice as part of the ceremonial cleansing. So uh, we, we shouldn't necessarily confuse here, in, in modern terms, the, the term unclean, meaning they're under the condemnation of God 
or, or we shouldn't interpret it as they were excluded from the love of God or even the love of their community. The purpose of this law was to separate them to protect the rest of the community. So we all understand that. Somebody shout, Amen. And uh, uh, Charlie says it's worse than skin cancer. It sounds awful. Cheryl says not to mention how the community turns against them. No family, no love, complete isolation. So it, it, it was a way of protecting the community. Okay? So I'm not going to read through all of the rest of this because it gets, it, it's, it's quite laborious. So let me just hit the high tops, the mountain tops, so to speak, the high points. Okay? The priest shall examine him. He sees a spot of raw flesh in the swelling. In, in the swelling, they conclude it's leprosy. The priest shall pronounce him unclean, but not isolate him at first. If a man or woman was diagnosed with leprosy, they were no longer in isolation under the supervision of the priest. They lived on their own, excluded from the larger community of Israel. If you look down at verses 45 and 46, it talks about that. The leprous person who has this, the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip, and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So you've heard maybe in biblical movies or something or seen where someone has to come and cry, unclean, unclean. Okay? Very contagious, Cliff says. Uh Yes, Phyllis says it's an illustration of sin because it's contagious and destructive and leads to separation. Doesn't sin do all that if, if remained unchecked? Okay. So then in verses 12 through 17, they had to exa it examines an outbreak over his entire body. If the leprosy breaks out over the skin, if the leprosy has covered his body, he shall pronounce him uh, unclean. If the leprosy has covered all of his body, this is... Okay, let, let's just go ahead and read this because this, this is interesting here. Then the priest shall look, verse 12, and if the leprous disease breaks out in the skin so that the leprous disease covers all the skin of the diseased person from head to toe or head to foot, so far as the priest can see, then the priest shall look, and if the leprous disease has covered all of his body, he shall pronounce him clean. So this seems counterintuitive, really, but apparently dealing with those ancient skin diseases, this stage of the disease gave hope for recovery. In addition, it provides a powerful spiritual picture, given the association of leprosy with mankind's uh, awful condition. It, it's, it's interesting that like, if he sees it at the first stages, he can pronounce him clean. It's almost like a word, a blessing on the guy, considering him clean so he will hopefully come out of it. So uh, Mary says the one leper out of the ten lepers healed in Luke 17 were told by Jesus to go to the priest. Yes, remember that? Go to the priest and show that you are clean. Why? Because of Leviticus chapter 13. The one out of ten lepers who is mentioned as a foreigner has a knowledge that Jesus was the true high priest and therefore showed himself to him giving thanks, praising him. That's a powerful sermon right there, Mary, that you know the one leper came back to give thanks, so it teaches us thanksgiving, but also he came back acknowledging Jesus as the true high priest. And he was a foreigner, which you know, uh, drives home the point that the, the religious establishment of Israel really didn't receive Jesus. Christmas time's coming. Hallelujah. So, okay, you see kind of the, 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 the way this is rolling here, okay? I'm not going to read all of this. Um, 45 and 46 is, is leprosy is full blown. You're to be pronounced unclean and you're to go out into the, in, into isolation. Okay. So the leprous person is required really to be as one who mourns for the dead with uh, some great and public calamity. Okay. So he shall be unclean. He shall dwell alone. Now I want us to pause right here. Mark your Bible and turn with me to the book of Matthew, New Testament. Matthew chapter 8, one of my favorite, maybe my favorite 
chapter in the entire Bible. I've preached from it a gazillion times. Matthew chapter 8, notice verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountain, mount of the Sermon on the Mount, came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, look this, we don't, we don't, we're not, we don't get that he was crying unclean, unclean. We don't get any of this. We're just getting this guy wants to be healed. And he comes to Jesus and he kneels before him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. Or in the New King James, I am willing, be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go now and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Okay, Jesus carefully avoids stirring up a misunderstanding about his identity. But he tells him, go back, show yourself to the priest, do what you're supposed to do. If you look on over in Luke chapter 17 and verse 11, Luke chapter 17 verse 11, The Bible says on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and he entered a village and was met by ten lepers. This is what Mary Cargill was telling us. Who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. You know, he didn't pray. He didn't lay hands on them. He didn't anoint them with oil, though all that's biblical. But Jesus didn't do it. He just said, Go show yourself to the priests. And when they... And when he saw them, he said, go show show yourself to the priest. And they went and they were cleansed. And as they went, they were cleansed. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Okay, two things out of this, three things out of this. Jesus heals leprosy. Jesus heals sin. Also, in the Matthew 8, passage I love preaching from that because they're dealing with the will of God concerning healing and when the leper comes up and says Lord if you are willing you can make me clean and Jesus says I am willing I am it's not a question of my will here and then the man is cleansed of his leprosy then in in uh, Luke chapter 17 there's another powerful healing truth and that is he gives them a command Go, show yourself to the priest. That's all he does. And as they went, they were healed. It doesn't say they were healed immediately when he gave the command, but when they obeyed the command, they went and were healed along the way. Hallelujah. 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 Gail McGregor says, as they took steps into belief, they were healed. Isn't that beautiful? As they took steps into belief, They were healed. Praise God. I just thought that was awesome. So last night, Dana and I watched something. I I met a man uh, years ago in the 90s, uh, early, early 90s, in uh, my home county named William Ward. And he's now passed on and gone to be with the Lord. But Dr. Ward was probably in his 80s when I met him. And... uh, he used to come and preach in our county for a friend of mine. Now, Dr. Ward was well known in the tent meeting days of the 40s and 50s, and he had one of the largest tents in America. He was friends with Oral Roberts. He, was, uh, he used to publish this uh, book and magazine called Treasures that was absolutely a treasure. Uh, after he passed away, I went to Richmond and visited his widow, and she gave me some of those old treasures collections of his writings. He was brilliant. He had at least two earned doctoral degrees, had traveled to 88 nations of the world and preached. I mean, just a faith man, had 20 visits to heaven in his life. But he, he went to the Bahamas, and he was preaching in the Bahamas, and he went to a leper colony. And they told, he wanted to pray for the lepers, but they told him he couldn't get within like 100 yards, I think, of the lepers. So he said, just line them up. And they lined them up, and he prayed for them, and God healed over 50 lepers in one moment. So then, later on, he was in a meeting in America, and he heard a man say, the greatest miracle I've ever heard of, 
was when an evangelist went to Bahamas and 100 lepers were healed in a colony. And Dr. Ward thought, well, that was me, but it wasn't 100. And he talked to this guy and he said, no. But the story went that as you were praying, you also said, Lord, and even for those who are too weak to come out of their caves or their houses or whatever, we pray they're healed. And come to find out, all of them were healed, 100 lepers. And then they stayed under state supervision for a year, I think, to make sure they were healed and to see the progress they had made. So anyhow, I just thought it was a cool story that Jesus heals the lepers in the Bible and he heals lepers in modern day, you know, stories as well. Dr. William Ward, you can find it on YouTube. You know, it's a story of, uh, he's got a story of his visits to heaven. And he did, a, he did a thing with Sid Roth when Sid Roth looked way younger and he was interviewed by Sid Roth. Dr. Ward had a brother-in-law named Wallace Heflin who had a son and daughter who were powerhouse preachers, Wallace Heflin Jr. and Ruth Heflin. Now Ruth Heflin, here I'm going on stories and nostalgia here, but Ruth Heflin wrote a book called Glory. She gave me, handed me the original copy of it, the original edition of it. I have it in in my library. That book went on to really impact the people at the Brownsville Revival Movement. They read that book, and I was blessed by the book. And I met Ruth in Richmond where they had their campgrounds and then went over to Israel and met her in Israel because they had a prayer room in Israel where they would go and uh, minister to the Lord. Prophetic, prophesying over kings and princes. And anyhow, God still heals lepers. Can somebody shout amen? Okay, let's look at a takeaway from chapter 13. I know I didn't read the rest of it because it's a lot of text, but you can read it in your own time. Let's look at a takeaway from chapter 13. If anyone has leprosy, the priest shall declare them unclean and they shall live outside the camp. A leprous garment shall be burned. We didn't get into all that, but uh, anyhow, you can read it. What questions from chapter 13? I have only one question. And that is in verses 2 and 3, if you look at it, did the priest also serve as doctors? Did the priests, this is the question that Janice kind of raised earlier, did the priests serve as doctors? I thought it was an interesting question, comes out of the Quest Study Bible. So if you guys have any response to this, I know you guys are reading your study Bibles out there, and I was just going to join in with you. What say you? Emily says, I have that book, and I've been to the Ashland Pentecostal Campground many times. Wow. Hey, Emily. She said two heel spurs were healed at those camp meetings. I was at those camp meetings and I saw gold dust, oil pour out of people's hands, saw all kinds of stuff. So, so Cindy says, seems so. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? I'm just going to read you what the Quest Bible has here in a minute. Yeah, I went to those campgrounds and spent three days in fasting and prayer with a friend of mine. In their winter camp meeting, and it was a it was a time I will never forget, never forget. It's the first time I'd ever seen gold dust in a service. Absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Good to see Francis and John logging on with us. Good to see Ronnie White and Jane and uh, Demar and Lestasia. Good to see all you guys logging on with us tonight. Okay, I'm going to read you an answer from the, from the Quest Bible. Did the priests serve as doctors? The Quest, is, Quest Bible is saying, though priests diagnose skin conditions, they did not attempt to cure them. So though they diagnosed skin conditions, they did not attempt to cure them. So Ed Turner says, I think priests were more like designated observers. That is exactly what the Quest Bible is saying, Brother Ed. And Brenda says as much, the study, my, her study Bible says the priests were responsible for the health of the camp. And then Phyllis says they were responsible for the he- camp. And then uh, Carola says they may have helped to diagnose, but they didn't seem to heal it. 
I think all you guys are, are correct there. So the priests diagnosed skin conditions. They did not attempt to cure them. Okay? So uh, instead, they guarded the spiritual health of the camp by discerning who was clean and then determining how long that person should remain isolated. They seemed, uh, Bill says they seemed to diagnose, not treat. You, you guys are exactly right. So uh, Cheryl says they were administrators of public health. There were Jewish doctors. Okay, so that would have been a different scenario. Okay, great, great answers, guys. Let's go to chapter 14, and let's dig into this. Okay? And this gets more into the sacrifices required for leprosy. Okay? And so... I may breeze through this because that 15th chapter of bodily discharges, I know y'all are just waiting to hear. I'm sorry. All the word is good. I'm not making light of it, but it is like, wow, God dealt with everything. Are you kidding me? Chapter 14, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person on the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. And if the, then, if the case of leprous disease is healed on the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed, two live clean birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet yarn, and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all of his hair and bathe himself in in water and he shall be clean and after that he may come into the camp but live outside his tent seven days and on the seventh day he shall shave off all of his hair from his head his beard and his eyebrows and shall shave off all of his hair and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and he shall be clean isn't this wild so then it talks about the uh the the sacrifices required if someone's poor there are provisions for that as well so okay so the priest shall go out of the camp when it believed someone was healed of leprosy arrangements were made for the priest to examine the afflicted person the leper did not come back to the tabernacle the priest went out of the camp to the community of lepers to make the examination okay so the priest was to examine him if he was clean then sacrifices were to be made but it's really interesting on this sacrifice this one there's be cedar wood scarlet yarn hyssop branches, and birds sacrificed. Okay? So cedar is extremely resistant to disease and rot. And these qualities may be the reason for including them here. And most commentators believe that scarlet here is yarn, not cloth itself. Because it was made uh, used for the making of the curtains of the veil of the tabernacle. And its color may have represented blood. And hyssop branches were used for the sprinkling of blood or water. Remember Psalm 51 in David's great repentance psalm, he says, but purge me with hyssop. He admitted that he was as bad as a leper in saying that. Oh, isn't that powerful? Purge me with hyssop, which means he identified himself with the leper's sacrifice. Whew. One of the birds was to be killed. In the ritual, the first bird was killed in a clay bowl. And that, that contained water from a spring creek or river, the running water. And the blood of this sacrificed bird was collected together with the water in the clay bowl in which the bird was killed. And the Hebrew preposition here implies that the action is to be performed over the clay pot so the blood of the bird falls into the pot and is mixed with the spring water. Running water represents the living water. And then the cedar wood served for the handle. The hyssop and the living bird were attached to it by means of the scarlet wood, wool or crimson. And then the bird was so bound to this handle so that its tail should be out downwards in order to be dipped in the blood of the bird that had been killed. And the whole of this made an instrument for the sprinkling of the blood. Then the living, living bird was loosed in an open field after declaring the leper cleansed. And the priest let the blood-stained living bird fly away. So instead of a scapegoat, which we'll read about in the Day of Atonement, 
It was like a scape bird. A bird on which the blood of the sacrifice bird had been sprinkled was able to fly away and uh, go free. It's a symbol of freedom. So let's look at this, some points. This happened outside the camp. A living thing of the heavens was sacrificed in an earthen vessel. Even as the bird was killed, it was cleaned by, cleansed by running water. And this death associated with water and blood was applied to the leper and applied perfectly seven times in connection with a living bird. And the sacrificial blood was also applied to scarlet yarn and a piece of, piece of wood together with hyssop. Bearing the mark of sacrifice, the living bird flew away Ascending out of the heavens. Man, this would make a wooden man shout. Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp of Israel. Jesus was a man from heaven. Jesus remained cleansed and holy even in his death, becoming sin for us. Jesus came by water and the blood, 1 John 5, and died in association with water and blood. Jesus died in association with the scarlet cloth, Matthew chapter 27. Jesus died in association with wool, John 19. Jesus died in association with hyssop in John 19, 29. And Jesus lived bearing the marks of his death, and he ascended to heaven out of human sight. Isn't that something? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. A lot of type and a lot of shadows here wrapped up in this thing. Amen? Wow. Okay. So then there's a presentation at the tabernacle. And the leper is uh, allowed back into the community. And one male lamb is a trespass offering, verses 12 through 14. And then there's an application of oil in verses 15 through 18. And the oil was used as medicinal treatment in biblical times. But it also was used for anointing things representing the power of God. Wow, isn't this incredible? Isn't this incredible? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, let's look at this. Let's look at verses 15 through 18. Chapter 14. Let's look at this. The Bible says, chap, verse 15, Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand and dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And some of the oil that remains in his hand the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on, one, on the big toe of his right foot, and on the top of the blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand shall I put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. So it's interesting that like uh, one, one person said, this dramatic act, this cleansed leper, is there's a sense in which God regards him again as a priest and king in the anointing of oil. Hallelujah. Are y'all getting anything out of this tonight? Give me some... Give me some shout online. Hallelujah. So, in verse 33, there's another turn that happens, and it's not necessarily dealing with people anymore. It's dealing with homes. So, verse 33, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, I put, and I put a case of leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession... Then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, there seems to be, uh, to me, the case of leprous disease or disease in my house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to examine the disease, lest all that is in the house be declared unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to see the house. He shall examine the disease, and if the disease is in the walls of the house with greenish or reddish spots, and if it appears to be deeper than the surface, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days, and the priest shall come in again on the seventh day and examine it again. And uh, then verse 40, then the priest shall command that they take out the stones in which the disease is and throw them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall have the inside of the house scraped all around and the plaster that they scrape off, they shall pour out in an unclean place. Then they shall take out other stones and put them in the place of those stones and he shall take the other plaster and plaster the house. If the disease breaks out in the house again after he's taken out the stones and scraped it, then the priest shall go and look. And if the disease has spread in the house, it is a persistent leprous disease in the house and it is unclean. And they shall break down the house, its stones and timbers and all the 
plaster of the house, and they shall carry them out of the city into an unclean place. Isn't that fascinating? That God was so concerned about this that he didn't want, uh, he didn't want even, even the houses infected. Even the houses infected, okay? So to keep it all clean all around, all right? So, verse 48, If the priest comes and looks and the disease is not spread into the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean for the disease is healed. And for the cleansing of the house, he shall take two small birds with cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop. Same type of offering was to be taken to cleanse a house as to cleanse a leper. There's so much symbolism in this, I want to preach it now. There's so much symbolism in those things that speak of, speak, and then David saying, cleanse me with hyssop, and he considers himself basically a leper. Oh, golly. I love the Bible. It's one of my addictions in life. Amen. Okay, so let's look at a takeaway from this chapter. If anyone is healed of leprosy, they shall shave their hair and bring offerings. If a house has mildew, the priest shall inspect it. Listen, God was so concerned for these things. Really, I, I mean, I am a historian, and I've studied ancient history since I've been uh, 20 years old. And so I really don't know of anything like this in the ancient world. This was, they were really beyond their time because they were serving the Lord. This is what serving the Lord does for you. He takes you into another season. He takes you and gets you ahead of your time. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, so let's now look at any questions I have. I have, I have one question, and I don't think we need to, we've already answered it, and that was what was the ritual in uh, verses 4 through, four through 7, because I thought that ritual was so fascinating with the hyssop and the... Uh, the cedar wood and all that kind of stuff. I just thought it was so... Uh, let me just read an answer from the Quest Bible. The two clean birds represented the person being cleansed. The killed bird symbolized the penalty required for sin through its death, and the bird atoned for the person's uncleanness. The freed bird symbolizes the removal of the person's sin and the guilt and the resulting cleansing perhaps similar to the scapegoat we'll find in chapter 16 with the Day of Atonement. And the significance of the other elements of this ceremony, the cedar with the scarlet yarn and the hyssop, is not known, but we see them used throughout Scripture in different ways. Okay, So Travis says olive oil has various potent effects, including antimicrobial, antioxidant, immunomodulatory, and anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, hep hepatoprotective, and anti-neurodegenerative, and anti-protective, uh, neuroprotective, and other beneficial health effects. Olive oil. Y'all hear that? Uh, Phyllis says it's an amazing. Everything is done on the right, and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Yep, right earlobe, right thumb, right toe anointed. Amen. And Janice says, why did the Lord put the leprous plague in the house? I, I, I noticed that too. That's how it reads. But I don't take that. I take that. I didn't take that literally like uh, the Lord himself did it. I, I didn't take it literally like that. If somebody has an uh, answer to that, because I don't think the Lord, it could have been like the Lord had allowed it uh, because of some disobedience of Israel or something like that. So he is outside of time, space, matter, and created them so, because he created them so good, Cindy says. So if anybody has an answer to Janice, we'll roll on to chapter 15 and finish this out. Then next week, we're going to get into two very, if we have time, first of all, is the Day of Atonement. That is Yom Kippur. It's coming on us at the end of September. We're in the Yom Kippur time, where there's Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, or Rosh Hashanah into Yom Kippur. So this is a super important month, and I've talked about it in church, how much I love this month. So uh, we'll talk about that next time. And then if time, one of the following chapters deals with sexual morality in the camp of Israel, homosexuality and bestiality and all that stuff is addressed. And I think it's a super important that we hear that now in our time. So if anyone has an answer to Janice, you let it roll. I'm going to go on to chapter 15. 
We have a little bit of time here left. So 15. The Lord, Leviticus chapter 15, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When a man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this is the law of, of his uncleanness for a discharge, whether his body runs with his discharge or his body is blocked up by his discharge. It is his uncleanness. Every bed on which the one with the discharge lies shall be unclean, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean till that evening. Whoever sits on anything on which the one with the discharge has sat shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches the body of the one with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be unclean until the evening. And the, if the one with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes If the one uh, and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And any saddle on which the one with the discharge rides shall be unclean. And whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries such things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And anyone with whom whom uh, anyone whom the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall be uh, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And an earthenware vessel that the one with the discharge touches shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed with water. And the one who had the discharge, when he's cleansed of his discharge, he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes and shall bathe his body in fresh water and be clean on the eighth day. He shall take two turtle doves and then make sacrifice. So here's the deal. God is concerned. He's so concerned about the community health that here any kind of man that has some kind of discharge from his body, it's, there's to be a cleanliness about all of it. There's to be a cleanliness about all of it, Okay. Now, in verse um, uh, 16, if a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and shall be unclean until the evening. And every garment and, and every skin on which the semen comes uh, shall be, on which it comes, shall be washed with water and be unclean till evening. If a man lies with a woman and has an emission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. I told you, it's getting deep here, so... But God was so concerned about the community health and about people's health that he went down to the details of life, even into the private lives of uh, men and women. Isn't that very interesting? So uh, Carolus said, could it be that the evil spirits lived in the Canaanite house that the Lord put the plague on? Okay, so more like it was a plague upon the Canaanite houses that they had occupied or they would occupy maybe. That's a possibility. Um, very interesting. Okay, now they deal with women here, uh, verses 19 through 33. If a woman has a discharge and the discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything on which she lies during the menstrual impurity shall be unclean. Everything also on which she sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches her, shall, her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be unclean. And whoever touches anything on which she sits. And the same kind of, uh, same kind of cleanliness laws as to the man. Verse 25, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge shall continue in uncleanness, she shall. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. Okay? So, very in, then there's a, then there's a sacrifices given for the uncleanness. And verse 31, Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. So here we've been talking about, you know, all these laws made perfect medical sense, perfect community health sense, but still yet the big overarching purpose was that they could approach the Lord, that his tabernacle would be holy, that the children of Israel could approach him and he could remain in their midst 
it's, it's, a, it's an interesting deal. Then verse 32, this is the law for him who has a discharge and for him who has an emission of semen becoming unclean thereby also for her her who is unwell with her menstrual impurity, that is, for anyone, male or female, who has discharge and for the man who lies uh, with a woman who is unclean. Okay, so let's look at a takeaway from this. Let's look at a takeaway from this chapter. When a man has a discharge, he is unclean. When he ejaculates, he is unclean until evening. And when a woman has her period, she is unclean. That's about as raw as we can put it tonight. So let's look at verses 5 through 13. We talk about all this bathing and all the clean, clean, cleans, cleanliness that had to take place. How did the people in the middle of the desert find water? How did the people in the middle of the desert find these? How did they find that? Interesting. It's my last question for the night. How did they find that? Janice said, could these discharges be venereal disease? Possibly. Possibly. So how did they find fresh water in the middle of a desert? Let me, let, let me give you something here. Water was drawn from natural artesian wells or collected in cisterns from rainfall. So not all the Israelites would have bathed daily only those with bodily discharges or flows of blood. So ritual bathing, which called in Hebrew the mikvah, ritual bathing and the washing of clothes did not necessarily involve immersion, but involved washing in a small basin, which means the amount of water required would have been much less than the description seems to suggest. And this is according to some scholars. So they had cisterns. If you go with me to Israel in the future, you'll see these things. There are cisterns that were, that were collected in most of those ancient sites. And I'm thinking here as I read that of the society at Qumran. Because if you go, to, go with me to the Qumran uh, society down in the desert, in the Judean desert, you'll see that they had uh, special places that would have been mikvahs, which would have been ritual baths that they would have gone through. Uh, you know, I don't know. I've, I've always heard that this is what was happening with Bathsheba on the rooftop, that maybe she was in a, uh, a mikvah, a uh, ritual bath, and that's when David saw her. Uh, very, very interesting, huh? Very interesting. So uh, Travis said they, they followed water, oasis, wells along the travel routes. Okay, that sounds very reasonable. And God provided, we know God provided water for them out of a rock supernaturally. So here's the deal. Interesting, God deals with leprous diseases, skin diseases. God deals with mold and possibly the diseases in a home. And God deals with the emissions from human bodies. And he, and he gives them societal laws right down to those details. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Last time we talked about the dietary laws that he was concerned about. And now even down. And before that, we talked about the societal laws, how you get along with people and Ten Commandments and how you treat people and um, how you don't use um, usury or interest when you borrow money to one of your brothers and you take in strangers and there's the Le Levitical laws of uh, property, that property is always returned to those who are indebted uh, in the Jubilee years. And then every Sabbath year, you take a break. Every Sabbath year, you give your field a break and you just live off the wild produce that comes out of your field. I mean, God had it down to the details because he cares for his people and he cares for us in the same way. Hallelujah. Can everybody say amen? We did it. We did it. Chapters 13, 14, 15 of Leviticus. Only a few more chapters and we're out of Leviticus. And then we'll get into Numbers, and uh, which has got some super cool stories in it. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your power. Lord, I thank you for your word, which is so good to us. And I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you bless everyone listening tonight and watching. Bless us as we come into this weekend and celebrate you and worship you, Lord, in Elizabeth City and Edenton and our campuses. And I just give you praise, Lord.
Bless this Lord tonight now in Jesus' name. Everybody can shout amen. See you guys Sunday morning.